Otherwise, I could have been fooled. Although I thought it was enough for the morning worship service. <laughs> so I stand now. If somebody will take the lady into my office, uh, I'll go on preaching. So my wife and the Presbyterian brother and the church treasurer marched the lady off into the office. I went back to the pulpit. Well, I could have preached anything. They wouldn't have argued after that, believe me. <laughs> they were a dark. Their faces were pale, their eyes and their mouths were wide open. But I didn't get to preaching for very long because the office was behind the platform on the left and there were dull thuds coming out of the office. And my wife, who's not given to being over-emotional, put her head round the door and said, you better come in here quickly. So I said, well, I'll close my sermon and you can either stay in the church and pray or go home and pray. And as I was going to walk into the office, the mother and father of the young woman came up to me, very godly, saintly people. And the mother said, Mr. Prince, was that our daughter? And you know, I did not know how to answer. The woman's personality and features and conduct had changed so totally that I felt embarrassed to say yes. And I said, I think it must have been. There wasn't anyone else sitting on that form. Must be your daughter. They said, can we come in? I said, yes. Then the woman's husband came in. And there was quite a scene in the office. The church treasurer and the Presbyterian brother were holding one arm on each side of the woman and she was shaking them around like a couple of rats. And every time she got her arms free, she was tearing her clothing off. And when she wasn't tearing hers off, she was tearing somebody else's off. And then the family came in, and I thought, this is where Pentecostal preachers meet their Waterloo. And I said to myself, now let me take this slowly. I said to the father and the mother and the husband, I said, if you'd like to take this young lady to a psychiatrist, you're very welcome to do so. But I said, I will do nothing more unless you all ask me to do so. So immediately they all said they wanted me to help her. So I said, well, then I think everybody that's not a member of the family, apart from my wife and myself, should step outside, and they did. Then it came out in conversation that this woman had become infatuated with her husband's brother, was writing strange letters to him which had a kind of double meaning, and had one of these letters there in her purse at the time. God showed me that it was useless to pray for her any further till she were, would renounce this sinful relationship. It took about ten minutes to persuade her to do so, and then I said, if you will renounce it, give me that letter out of your purse, and I'll tear it up in front of your eyes and drop it in the waste paper basket. And she did. Then I said, now we can pray. And because it was a woman, I would have been fully happy if my wife had been the one to pray. But God seemed to show me in a way that I cannot express in words that it was my business. Put my hand on her and started to pray for her, and immediately she slumped to the floor. And then again, God showed me in this inner way that I, there was only one position of her body in which she could get deliverance, and that was with her head forward between her knees. So with my hand on the small of my back, I inclined her body forward and began to command the evil spirits to come out of her. And this may sound extraordinary, but as they passed the palm of my hand, I could count them one after another as they passed. They came out naming themselves with filthy, unclean, sexual names. And then each time they came out, she would spit out a little piece of white cloth I tell you, it was a somewhat unusual scene for a pastor's office on Sunday morning. About two o'clock in the afternoon, the woman was totally exhausted. She lay back on her back, and after about ten minutes, put her arms in the air and began to praise Jesus for deliverance. As far as I know, she was fully delivered. But she never came back to that church. She was too embarrassed. And I fully understand, in the light of the way churches are, her attitude. This showed me how totally ineffective the church is amongst other ways that I've come to see this, that when people really need help, our atmosphere, our standards, the so alien that the people that really need us don't dare to come to us. After that, my wife and I were launched. We've never had to ask for customers ever since. Mainly, they did not come to the church. They came to our home. And we would be up every night of the week till about 2 a.m., counseling and praying with people. How they got to know who we were or where we were, I couldn't explain. And in the end, I realized I was breaking down my physical strength and this was not the way to do it. And the Lord showed me gradually, step by step, that this must be part of my public ministry, just like everything else. It was to be preached in public and done in public. And I saw that this was how Jesus did it. Regularly in every synagogue, he preached and cast out evil spirits. He didn't take people away into a psychiatrist's consulting room and deal with them on the couch 
It was part of his open public ministry. And the preacher and the church alike have got to face the fact that evil spirits are real, they're beastly, they're ugly, they're dirty, and thousands and thousands of people need deliverance from them, and it's our job to do something about it. And if the carpet gets spoiled, so what? One place I preached, and it's a well-known church, known to most of you here, and I won't name it, and I was, I admit, I was a little rash. I went in without any preamble and preached deliverance from the Sunday evening service, and I had about 50 people lined up in a row at the front. I commanded the evil spirits to come out. Uh, I've never seen a thing like this before or since. A young man in his early 20s opened his mouth, and a stream of pure blood just shot out of his mouth onto the carpet. And you know what they were disturbed about? It spoiled the carpet. Well, I say, if the carpet gets spoiled, if the stained windows get broken, if the choir lose their robes, so what? We aren't here to have good carpets or stained glass windows or robed choirs. I'm not against them. But our business is to help humanity with the kind of help that Jesus Christ has provided for them through the gospel, which they can't get from the psychiatrist, nor the medical doctor, nor the psychologist. We are not a referral agency as ministers of Jesus Christ to psychiatrists, psychologists, or anybody else. Jesus has said, you heal the sick. You cleanse the leper. You raise the dead. You cast out demons. It's your job. Freely you have received, freely give. That's what it is to be in the Christian ministry. If you haven't received anything, be sure you can't give anything. But if you received, you didn't receive it in virtue of education. You didn't receive it by paying for it. It came freely by the grace of God. It has to be ministered as freely as it was given. Freely you have received, freely give. The Lord showed me other things at that time not in connection with deliverance, but connection with the nature of the local church. I was a fanatic about the local church. I was like a kind of Pentecostal Southern Baptist. I wanted everybody with their name on a roll and their membership card and signed up, and I'd like to see them sit in the same seat every Sunday morning. And if they weren't there, I wanted to know why. Well, is that your idea of church, brother? God bless you. God showed me it's very far removed from the New Testament church. God showed me over the years that the key word in the church is fellowship. We are called unto the fellowship of God's Son, Jesus Christ. The whole record of the New Testament was written by the apostles. John says it in his first epistle, These things declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. God showed me that the average church is the worst place in the world for fellowship. You have more fellowship in a prison than you have in a church. The moment you walk into a church building, everything about it tells you that anything that matters is going to happen from a raised platform at one end behind the pulpit and a PA system. And what is your business? To sit and listen. And what have you got to look at? The back of the neck of the person in front of you. And no one ever yet fellowships the back of somebody else's neck. I saw this with the most peculiar vividness. And there was a beautiful warm spirit in the Sunday morning service, and I preached a real good message, you know, like I usually do. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't read my book, Humility, and how I achieved it in seven chapters. <laughs> Anyhow, at the end of this message, this is what the pastor says. And uh, God bless him. It's just a picture of the whole thing. He said, now... He said, there's a beautiful spirit here. He said, don't go running off home. Stay and have some fellowship. Shake hands with at least half a dozen persons before you go. And I thought to myself, God, is that what we've sung to? Is fellowship shaking hands with half a dozen persons before you go? What a thin ration your poor people are living on. You see, today, one of the great changes coming is people are going with their fellowship. Fellowship is one of the key words. It's what people are hungry for. They're longing for today. They don't find it mainly in the institutional church. This is no criticism, it's an objective thing. Where are they finding it today? In their home, around a coffee table, or in a place like this, around the table. The full gospel businessman fellowship. You know the key word? Who cares about businessmen? It's not that. It's fellowship. That's what brings people together. I've seen this all over the world. Looking at one another's faces sharing meals together. The early church, that was it. They ate their meat, their food with gladness and singleness of heart from house to house, praising God and having favor with the people. And the Lord added to the church 
by and large, the unconverted could care less what we do inside the church building. It's just our peculiar aberration. We go there on Sunday morning and maybe Tuesday night. We're strange-looking people. We go in looking strange, and we come out looking strange, and that's all there is. But, friend, when it starts to happen in your home, the neighborhood will wake up. Sure, when your neighbors hear somebody speaking in tongues out of the bathroom at 1 a.m., they want to know what's going on. When they can't park their car in the street on Tuesday night because you have a Bible study, then they're going to start asking questions. What are these people got? They've come alive. That's what's happening today. Now, I, I believe we should conduct ourselves carefully. I don't believe we should offend or irritate our neighbors unnecessarily. But this is when the church is beginning to blossom up. If we've got something real, it'll stand the test. It doesn't have to live in a hothouse. And the gospel is no hothouse plant. It's the toughest, sturdiest, most vital thing that God ever produced in all creation. We don't have to apologize for it. We don't have to blush for it. We don't have to wrap it up in cotton wool. We don't have to speak in a peculiar tone of voice. We just have to demonstrate it, live it, preach it, act it. It works. The year 1963, this was a key year in the life of my wife and myself in many ways. I was for a short time associate pastor of an Assembly of God church in the Midwest, in Minneapolis. And my wife and I normally pray together each morning, which is a good thing to do. This particular morning we were praying together and it seemed that the presence of God came into the room. My wife had her arms stretched up towards the ceiling and after a little while she turned to me and she said, Derek, God has just given me the gift of healing in my hand. And I said, you don't need to tell me. I know it. How I knew it, I don't know, but I did. That morning we went to the morning prayer meeting and at the close of the prayer meeting about noon, a lady came up to my wife said, Sister Prince, would you pray for me? My wife wasn't thinking about what had happened earlier that day. She put her hand on him. The woman went down, stayed on the floor for ten minutes. Came up apologetically and said, I'm sorry, I just couldn't help it. So my wife realized that it was for real. After that time, my wife began to pray for the sick. Now, she had always prayed for the sick. And the sick had been healed many times. But she tells me this is new. Because before it was me praying, I was getting hold of God. Now, she said, I just stand aside, open myself up, and let the Lord do it. It is entirely different. It is absolutely a gift. I have nothing to do with it. Strangely enough, at that time, I don't know why, I can't explain why, uh, when my wife prayed for persons, if God healed them, they would normally start to jump up and down. Very strange thing. They'd just go straight up and down, like that. And, you know, in the Assembly of God Church, you don't do things like that. There was one elderly, very thick set sister, German background, who was timid and retiring, and she had a heart condition. She wanted my wife to pray for her, but she didn't want to be prayed for in the church. So one day she waited till we were out in the parking lot in the box to separate, and she said, Sister Prince, would you pray for me? And the lady was standing just by the door of our car waiting to get in. My wife put her hand on her, and she started to go up and down, up and down, this heavy German lady. Straight up and down like that. And her husband was trying to get her into the car and she couldn't get in. And he said, do stop it. He said, the police will come. What are we going to tell them? But he just went on up and down. So God has his way of doing things. Now, all this is a kind of sketched background of my career or ministry, whatever you like to call it. And when I stood up here, I didn't intend to go this route at all. But thank God we're moving on. And just lately, the Lord has started to do something new very remarkable. I trust you believe me. What I say in almost every case can be attested by many witnesses. In June of this year, I had the privilege of speaking at the Full Gospel Business Men's Fellowship International Convention in Chicago. And there was a brother there, Brother Popel, of whom it was stated that he prayed for people and their legs got length. So one night in the convention, my wife and I were invited up to the 23rd floor of the Chicago Conrad Hilton Hotel. And there were most of the international directors of the Businessmen Fellowship and Brother and Sister Papel and a few of the preachers and so on. And after a little introductory talk, Brother Papel got somebody sat down in a chair, measured their legs, showed them that they weren't equal, prayed, and the unequal leg grew out. After a few people had been ministered into this way, I said to my wife, you better get into that chair. She got in, and when they measured her legs carefully, side by side, the left leg, if I believe, I believe, might have been the right, I think it was the left leg was an inch and an eighth shorter than the right. And she'd gone through life not knowing that. Isn't that remarkable? 
They played, and the leg grew out till they were absolutely equal. Then she said, you better get into the channel. I said, I think my legs are equal. I've never had any reason to believe my legs are unequal. She said, you better try. So I got in, and they measured them. My left leg was a quarter of an inch shorter than the right. They prayed. Uh, something like a hand was put on the top of my hip and out shot my leg, and they were equal. Now, you might think a quarter of an inch doesn't make much difference, but I'll tell you it's made a tremendous difference to me. Prior to that time, if I would stand for over an hour preaching, I would get a kind of pain of tension in my back, which really could become quite serious. Since then, I've been able to stand two and three hours and feel no pain at all. The change in my wife was even more remarkable. In fact, it was extraordinary. First of all, for about a month afterwards, she felt she was bruising her left heel every time she walked because she hit the ground so hard. Secondly, her stride lengthened about 50%. Up to that time, we'd been married, had been married almost 25 years. We'd never been able to walk together. I, I cannot, I could not walk with the length of stride she took. I'd walk ahead, walk back, and go ahead again. And people have often laughed at this. But since then, her stride has lengthened literally 50%, I would say. And we can walk together for the first time in 25 years. Well, as I stood there and watched this... Something in me said, you can do that. And I said, I believe I could do that. And of course, all the good brethren and that said, Brother Prince, of course you can do that. But nothing happened. So then I went down to a training course in Jamaica, organized by the Holy Spirit Teaching Mission. And I met there a brother whom I've known for quite a while, Brother John Beckett from Illyria, Ohio. And I knew already, I'd had a report from Brother Beckett, about 70 people that had their legs lengthened in a weekend convention that he conducted. Now, Brother Beckett is not a preacher. He's a very sharp and successful young businessman. And I knew that what he said had to be real. We got down there, and the second night, with about 40 or 50 of us in fellowship for a period of about three or four weeks, people's legs started to grow up. There was one girl who had had polio seriously, and her spine was twisted in an X shape. The whole body was crooked. We prayed for the leg to grow out, and then when the body straightened, the leg needed to grow out again. And she told me near the end of those m m meetings that altogether she'd counted that one leg had grown out four inches over that period of time. There was a young teacher from Oxnard, California, from the high school there, named Bill Bersansky, and this clicked with him. He just couldn't find enough people to, to lengthen their legs. We ran out of candidates in the, con in the group. There was nobody left. And he would go out to the night watchman and say, Now, if, if you see a miracle, would you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And the poor dazed man would look at him and say, Yes. And Bill would say, Now, sit down and let's measure your legs. And in most cases, they weren't equal. So then Bill would pray and the leg would grow out and then they'd pray with the man for salvation. John Beckett went down to a hairdresser, a colored hairdresser down there, Got talking to him, discovered the man was a Christian, sat him down in his own barber's chair, and his leg was lengthened in his barber's shop. And one evening, John Beckett said to me, you better do this while there's anybody left. So I knelt there and held his feet, and they grew out. Or it grew out. So I, I, I knew this was from God. And I thank God, in a sense, I have a fairly open mind. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'll listen to anything. So after that, I had to go uh, hurriedly and at short notice back to Europe because of my mother's death and other things. I came back and I was to preach at the Tennessee CFO, which holds its meetings in Eatonton, Georgia, Rock Eagle, 4-H Camp. Was anybody there by any time? All right, well then, I've got witnesses firsthand, and that's good. The first day I was there, I wasn't to speak till the afternoon, and uh, I felt desperately that I needed to get alone with God because I'd been giving out and traveling, and I, I needed something more from God before I could minister to others. So I went out into the very beautiful wooded country there, and I did something that I've come to love. I prostrated myself on my face before Almighty God and told him that's where I belonged and that's what I was, that I came from the dust and that was my place, which is true of every one of us. And I asked God to cleanse me in the blood of Jesus, make me what he wanted me to be. And in a very strange way that it's impossible to describe, I became aware of a fact that there was an evil spirit that I had never been delivered from. And had I searched and guessed, I would never have thought of it. It was the spirit of embarrassment. But when the Lord showed me this, I realized that my whole uh, life from early boyhood had been conditioned by consideration for what people would think and say about me. 
I've been brought up in a British tradition where you don't show emotion, the stiff upper lip, and you don't, you never let your feelings be known. And I remember even when I was quite young, if my mother would go into a store to complain about anything, I'd say, you go in, but I'm not going to get involved in that. I'll stay outside. I don't like these scenes. And over the years, this had gone on and on in my life. And you can adjust to a thing like that. You can learn and kind of play around the danger point. And many, many people who have known me would not have picked on this thing in me. But God told me that morning that it was there, and I got rid of it. As soon as I know an evil spirit is there, I know what to do to get rid of it. And it went. And I must say, for my own part, part not speaking about what other people think or see in me, this has had the most wonderful change in my life. I have a relaxation that I never really knew before. I tell you honestly, I could care less what the world thinks now, or say. So I went back, and I knew God was going to work. I, he had showed me already, and I, I believed that we were going to see this miraculous operation of God, and I just wanted to start with the right case. And I sat in the lunch, at lunch, in the dining hall next to a friend of mine, Paul Petrie, who's the leader of Christ Center in Lexington, Kentucky, young man of Methodist background, and I began to talk to this. He said, you better start in me. I thought, that's the Holy Spirit. I said, what's the matter with you? And he said, first of all, my leg is short, and secondly, my arm is short, my whole body is twisted, and then he said, there's my teeth after that. So I sat him down in the chair, measured his legs, and sure enough, one was a good inch shorter than the other, and even before I could pray, it grew out. Stood him up against the pillar and measured his arms, one was about three quarters of an inch shorter than the other, it grew out. And that, I mean, visibly, everybody could see it. And there were about 10 or a dozen people standing around. When I started, there were about 50 when I finished. Then I said, what about your teeth? Well, he said, the whole of my front row are uneven. they in front of one another, up and down. Well, I said, we'll see what the Lord will do. I put my hands on his feet and prayed. And I said, do you feel anything? Does your mouth feel funny? He said, he feels kind of full. Well, I said, I think the Lord is doing something. And I had to go away to keep an appointment. About 30 minutes later, his wife came up. She said, do you want to see Paul's teeth? I said, yes, what's happened? She said, the whole front row is straightened out completely. And it was, even and straight. Well, that started something that had very little to do with Brother Prince. By the end of that meeting, as the people here were testified, there were groups praying for people all over that campground. And I would say, at a conservative estimate, 300 people must have had legs or arms or both lengthened. There was a girl that had been in Jamaica with us, Faith Blatchford, whose father is an Episcopal priest, and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Jamaica this summer, and is in this ministry himself now. And Faith was praying with a, a girl who was a beautician, and the one leg was shorter than the other. Faith prayed, the leg came off. Then the girl said, I think my arms are uneven too. Faith prayed, the other arm came off. And then the girl said, the trouble in my profession is I, my, my arms aren't long enough anyhow. Faith prayed again, and both arms threw up. Now... This is not a gimmick, I want to say that. This is just God demonstrating that he's for real. The majority of people, full gospel or not full gospel, have never witnessed an objective miracle in their lives. It's an extraordinary thing. And when a person sees a visible, physical miracle actually take place in front of their eyes, it does something. I say it's God's booster rocket to get your faith in orbit. Don't be content with a one miracle, get a package deal. Get remade, re-straightened, cleaned out, made whole. Start at the feet and work upwards. Every time a person comes to me for prayer for healing, I say, do you mind if we start with the feet? But that's where God has shown me to begin. And they look at me as if I was a little strange. But about 80% of people have legs of unequal length. This is a fairly well-attested medical statistic. That means 80% of people are lame. But Proverbs 26, verse 7 says this, the, lame, the legs of the lame are unequal. You turn that around, it means if your legs are unequal, you're lame. Now, lots of people know they're lame, but lots of people are walking around like my wife and me, lame, seriously lame, and affecting our spine, our posture, our general health, and not knowing it. I'll just tell you a few more examples. And I want to say, right now, this is only paddling in the shallow water, but it's the start of the restoration of the miraculous to the body of Jesus Christ, not just to a few wonderfully gifted evangelists for whom we thank God, but this is where the body is going to start doing miracles to itself and to the womb. The thing about this is it's infectious, not with everybody, but as soon as some people have seen about six cases, they go off and start doing it. 
Uh, I was in um, Florida before I left. And some friends of mine came up and said, would you be surprised to hear that we had our legs lengthened last night? I said, I'm, I'm pleased, but I'm certainly not surprised. Because I know when it starts, it'll go on, it'll spread. And God is visiting area after area with the manifestation of the miraculous. A little while after being in Eatonton, I was in Tennessee in a retreat with people who were mainly of Methodist background, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, and others as well. We prayed for many, many people, especially children. The, the children get so fascinated, you can't get them away. They'll stand there and watch. And I like to have them there. Because when a child has seen that happen about half a dozen times, the teacher can say what he likes about God at school, but that child knows better. One of these little boys in about grade two went back to school on Monday morning and they had share and tell. Now he stood up and he shared and told three objective statements. That's all he said. The first was, over the weekend we were at a such and such a state park for a retreat. Statement number one. Statement number two, God was there. Statement number three, my leg was lengthened. He sat down. The teacher said, yes. <laughs> Privately, the teacher took him aside and said, yes, I've heard of somebody else that happened to. It's really comical. Our, our, our married daughter from Chicago has just moved down to Fort Lauderdale in Florida, where we live, and her eldest son is our grandson, who's age 17, has just started attending Fort Lauderdale High School. And he's a very fine, active Christian boy. In fact, when he was in Park Ridge, Illinois, he started a prayer and Bible study group in that school, which is spread to every high school in the area. And let me tell you this, that you do not need to give up. If you know how to go about it, get the right constitution and the approval of one teacher, you can have a prayer group in any school in this nation. There's nothing in the constitution or the rulings of the high court to prohibit it. Christians just haven't discovered. Our grandson now is being flooded with requests for the constitution because people want to repeat it. And he's already, he's only been in Fort Lauderdale less than a month. He's already started a prayer group in the Fort Lauderdale High School. One of the courses that he's taking is the Bible as literature, which is, as you know, a permitted course. After about two lessons, the teacher, a man, said to him, uh, from the way you speak, you sound like a fundamentalist. So uh, our grandson Stephen said, yes, I am. So the teacher said, well, what church do you attend? So Stephen said, well, I actually I really don't go to any church, but I'm what you call Pentecostal. So the teacher looked at him in a little rather sort of shy way and said, you know, there's a place here in Fort Lauderdale I think you might be interested in going to. Um, Stephen said, what's that? And he said, it's called the Holy Spirit Teaching Mission. So Stephen said, yes, I know about that. And then the teacher looked at him and said, I was there last Sunday and I had my leg lengthened. <laughs> and Stephen said, I was there last Sunday and had my leg lengthened too. <laughs> This last convention we had, the teacher and his wife, both of them high school teachers, were right in the midst of the convention, praising the Lord, clapping their hands and everything. And that lady is responsible for organizing the curriculum for the Bible as literature in all the schools in that area of Florida. One thing I'll tell you, friends, don't give up in the public schools. Don't back out and let the devil move in. We've got a right to claim those schools for God, and a few spirit-filled, young, keen Christians can storm those citadels of Satan and take them for God. Don't have a negative attitude. The battle isn't lost. In fact, it's going to be won. Well, I was talking about being in Tennessee with this group. Now, I, I, there were several people. There was a dentist present who was a witness. There was a veterinarian. I can give you their names. And in the middle of this, there was a man there. I don't know what profession he was. I think he was a salesman of some kind. He was rather short of stature. And his wife was a little taller than he. And no one prayed, but he just said, I want to grow. He stood back to back with his wife and grew an inch and a half until he was taller than his wife. Now, this has caused me to look at the scripture. And I find in Luke 12, 25 and 26 this. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit, that's 18 inches, to his stature? If then ye be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for that which is great? So adding 18 inches to your stature is least in the sight of God. That don't, might, might not be the way we look at it, but it's the way God sees it. There was a dentist at this same retreat who had been at a CFO retreat at Tokoa, Georgia that I was at in the spring of this year. He and his wife came for deliverance and both experienced deliverance from evil spirits. And when the wife was delivered, I said, is there anything else wrong with you? You might as well get a package deal. Well, she said, I have eczema and I have an allergy and I have teeth that need filling. And I don't recall how I prayed for her. I do not remember. 
But when I met her this past September, she checked it off. She said, I was delivered. I'm healed of eczema. I have no allergy. And there's no cavities in my teeth. And her husband, the dentist, sat by her. I said, is that right? He said, they've been diagnosed by x-ray. I cannot find the cavity. But he said, it's all right as long as it happens to her because she doesn't pay any help. <laughs> then I was at Charlotte just recently at the convention of the full gospel businessmen there, and this thing just breaks out. In fact, it's almost embarrassing. At times, the, the passages get blocked. I was doing this the last night of the convention, and incidentally, a whole group of other people started doing the same thing. There were three or four groups in that convention, praying circles, and you'd hear excited giggles coming from different areas as some miracle took place. And I prayed for a, man, a woman, and then I prayed for a man, and I said, you know this is real, because of course people are somewhat doubtful when they first view it. The man stood up, he said, yes, I'm a chiropractor, and I know it's real. And he had just had his leg lengthened. In a home in Charlotte, two days later, I was praying for people. The lady said, would you mind if I fetch my chiropractor? I'd like him to see this. I said, no, bring him by all means. And he came, very nice, respectful man. So we watched two or three times. I said, it really looks as though God is coming out on the side of the chiropractor, doesn't it? And he said, you're in advance of us. He sat down in the chair, and I said, would you like me to pray for you? He said, yes, but I have an insert. Well, I said, the Holy Spirit can take care of that. When we prayed... The leg with the insert grew out exactly the amount of the insert. Then I had the privilege of speaking the last three nights in the largest Methodist church in Charlotte. The first night, I think about 30 people received the baptism. The next night, about 50 people received deliverance from evil spirits. And the real tool that opened the eyes and hearts of these people to the truth was this miracle. The one night I was there, and this, I think the second night, and it was about 11 o'clock at night, and I said, well, if the minister isn't here, we really shouldn't go on so late as this in the church. And a man stepped up to me and said, I'm the minister, you've just lengthened my leg. Um, I want you to know, of course, Brother Prince doesn't lengthen anybody's leg, you know that. When I left that church, that minister, he said this, he said, I wouldn't believe that six inches on a ruler could make so much difference to me and my family. But he said, in these last three days, my wife and I and our three children have all been prayed for, all our legs have been adjusted, and the total adjustment will amount to about six, inch, six inches. And he said, no, I know that God is real. This is what God is doing. Now, it is not the ultimate. It's just the beginning. But you see, the human race is going around crooked. Spiritually, morally, physically crooked. And the Lord is in the business of straightening out crooked humanity. By the time he's finished, and it's going quickly. The church of Jesus Christ is going to be straightened out, fit to meet the bridegroom, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's what it teaches in five tells us. Dear friends, most of us have got to do a lot of heart searching. The truth be told, many of us are not ready to meet the Lord. Some are resting on denominational affiliation. Some are resting on past experiences. God is not concerned with what happened 12 years ago. He wants to know where you are with him tonight. God is preparing the church to go forth with supernatural power, miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit, to reap the last great harvest of the age. We are living in the time of the latter rain, the last great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Immediately subsequent to this, the scripture makes it clear, is the harvest. Jesus said the harvest is the end of the present age. The harvest is the last great ingathering of souls. This gospel of the kingdom, and that's the gospel that heals the sick and cleanses the lepers and drives out demons and raises the dead. This gospel of the kingdom, not some gospel, but this gospel of the kingdom, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. That's where we are. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church has various specific purposes. First of all, to prepare the church as a bride to meet the bridegroom. Secondly, to prepare the church as workers in God's harvest field to go out and to reap the last great harvest. And I speak what I believe to be objective facts when I tell you this. Because of the population explosion, the population of the earth today is over 3 billion and will shortly exceed 4 billion. And it is growing at a rate that frightens the experts. But God knew all about that. 
He had it already prepared. He also knew the unusual proportion of young people that there would be. God had got it all worked out. In the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That's you young people. That's what God has for you. People in junior high and high school and college, this is the most glorious hour to be privileged to live in. Don't be scared. Don't compromise. Meet Jesus Christ. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Go out like David and face the land. And you bring him down with one little stone out of your sling. One miracle. And Goliath is stretched on his back. That teacher that had his leg lengthened, he's never going to be a critic of the gospel again. He just had to do one thing. And all Goliath's block collapses. The destiny of the world is in our hands. We are the people that have got the answer. We don't need to apologize. We don't need to compromise. We need to go out and do it. This has been another message brought to you by the Banner Tape Ministry. Knowing the power of messages like these, we ask you to share these tapes with others. You may obtain extra copies of this tape or our free tape catalog by writing to Banner Tapes, 504 Laurel Drive, Monroeville, Pennsylvania. Zip code 15146.